For today's meditation, I want to turn your attention to the scripture portion that we read in the Malayalam service as well, which is a very familiar Sam, Sam 23. If anyone is assigned this morning for the reading, you may now read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you. For today's meditation, I will not go through the entire psalm, but just one verse from, one uh, sentence from the psalm which will be taken from verse 3. He restores my soul. How many of you are happy for, for the fact that God is a God of restoration? Amen. Last uh, February when I preached from God's word, I had a similar topic, um, God of restoration. And I spoke about how God is able to restore our lost years. So today I want to talk. I want to uh, stick on the topic, um, same topic, God of restoration, but with the theme that God who is able to restore our soul. When I told my wife that I'll be preaching this sermon, she said, please don't repeat your illustrations. Um, particularly the fair and lovely one. Um, many people came to me and asked if it's available in the U.S., if it's available on Amazon. For whatever reason it is, um, uh, you, you should have it. You should take one. And... Uh, I also told you about the antique cars, how the restoration happens on antique cars and they're being sold in heavy prices these days and they're put up on exhibition and how people are marveled at the beauty of antique cars. Keep the illustration away. One thing that world cannot do is, even when they try with all the technology and all the updates in science, if they restore something, they cannot take it to its original state. Amen they cannot take it to its original state. There will be something that would lack in the newer version from the older version. But, um, uh, you know, scientists and doctors, when they do facial, facial surgeries, I recently heard a testimony of uh, um, uh, a girl uh, who is just 20 years of age. In her childhood, somebody said she's a boy and she changed her gender. She went through a surgery, and now at age of 10, 20, she met with Christ. She want to go back to her um, state of being a girl, and she went through a second surgery. So what I'm trying to say is, doctors said, we could try doing the surgery, but we cannot promise if you, if you could be restored to the original state, because that's impossible. Scientists say, we'll try our best, but there is no guarantee, right? There is no guarantee. But you know what? When God restores our life... When God restores our soul, what comes after will always be better off than before. What comes after will always be better off than before. I want to take you to some science classes. You know, our humans are made of three parts. Namely, spirit, soul, and body. I don't want to go into details, but just highlighting what each of it means. The spirit which we know is the innermost part of our body. It's the inner organ that possesses God conscious that we may come in contact with God. Without the spirit, we will not have the consciousness of God within us. Without the spirit, we wouldn't even come to church this morning. We come to church and we worship God because there is a connection that happens between our spirit and the spirit of God. Amen. Romans chapter 1 verse 9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. So we can serve with our body. And we can also serve with our spirit. John 4 verse 24, um, Jesus says, For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So what does the spirit here mention that this is mentioned? We can worship God through our lips. We can worship God through our body. We can worship God with all the noises and music in the room. But unless we worship God with our spirit within us, hallelujah, our worship is in vain. So spirit is through which 
we connect with the spirit of god secondly before i come to uh, soul which will be my focus of the day body body is the external part of our outer uh, uh, is the outer organ that possesses the body possesses world consciousness world consciousness that we may make contact with the material world when spirit tries to make contact with god the spirit of god the body tries to make contact with the material world the body contains soul and the soul is the vessel that contains the spirit so when you, somebody touch you if you don't have sensation on your body please meet with a doctor you may have a possible leprosy people in the old times with leprosy they wouldn't have any sensation in their body but they would have sensation in the spirit and in soul so these two aspect of our life the spirit and the body is important can i ask you one thing which is one element of our body among the three for which we spend a lot of time don't lie to your pastor all right now um uh, uh, uh you know uh, bible says there's always a battle a fight between the spirit and the body the flesh because the spirit wants to have connection with god and your body wants to make connection with the material world it's a huge struggle that's going on throughout your life every day you wake up there's a fight between your body and your spirit you know i don't know how many of you here i don't i know the almost the older folks have seen a weighing balance right the next slide the weighing balance you know in a weighing balance um uh if i go to a vegetable vendor or a fruit vendor i would see this not nowadays but back in those days how many of you not seen this which means you haven't seen it right so on one um plate of the on one one arm of the uh, of the balance there will be a there will be fruits or vegetables that is kept and equivalent weight iron weights will be kept on the other side so until the arm is in a straight line and reach equilibrium that's when you know that you have purchased or you is he was giving you the vendor is giving you the exact weight of the vegetable or the or the fruit you know one thing about these vendors i always had trouble with them because i thought they are always fooling me when i say please wait for the arm to reach equilibrium or reach that straight line they would say no 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 we know what we are doing and they used to refuse me they used to refute me they used to kick me out with the balances i used to lose my balance but now we have technology where we don't have these things we don't need these things we with the help of um, uh, analog and uh, digital scales we can measure exact weight of the fruit and the vegetable what i'm trying to say is your body and your spirit is in constant rivalry when the body goes down the scale that's when the world in you wins but when the spirit in the scale goes down that's when the holy spirit in you wins hallelujah every choices that we make every decisions we make every word that comes out of my out of my mouth every thought that in our mind will all be according to either the world or the spirit but we as children of god we have a responsibility not to keep the scale of the body or the world or the flesh down but the spirit the scale of the spirit should always be down and weighing more than the spirit of the world the third part is a soul what is soul soul is our our own very self in matthew 16:26 luke 9:25 we see that a medium between our spirit and our body possessing self consciousness somebody says self consciousness so your spirit has god consciousness your body has world consciousness and your soul has self consciousness this is our personality our soul perceive things in the psychological realm the greek word for um, a soul is psuche out of which the term psychology was uh, derived from so when you talk about psuche it's the soul that the bible refers to our soul is our personality it's who we are it's with our soul we think we reason we consider we remember we wonder we experience emotions like happiness 
love, sorrow, anger, relief, and compassion. All of these are associated with the soul. We are able to resolve with each other. We are able to make decisions and choices all because of the soul. Now, let me ask you, which of these three elements are most important? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the entire, the whole world, and forfeits his soul? Forfeits his soul. We can look after our body. We can look after our spirit by coming to worship, by connecting with God. But unless our soul is healthy, unless our soul is healthy, true worship cannot flow. True worship cannot flow. Jesus said, what can a man give in return for his soul? If it was important for Jesus, it's important to us as well. The context of Psalm 23, which we know uh, very well, is soul running after, um, running for his life because King Saul, uh, King David is running for his life because King Saul is wanting to take down David. There was, a, um, uh, there was a, a prophecy made upon King Saul that his kingdom and his throne will be ripped off. Everything that, is, that belongs to him, his kingdom will be taken down because he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So King Saul, who was very power crazy, craving for power and authority all his life, he wanted to pass on the throne of Israel to his descendants after him thought the only way that I could retain the power of Israel, the kingship of Israel in the lineage of my family is to do one thing, that is to take David down, kill David. But you know what? He didn't know whom he was playing with. He wasn't playing with just a man. He was playing with the anointed servant of God. You know, when we make remarks upon people, remember, they are not only just human beings. They are anointed people of God. When you play with them, you are playing with God. When you play with them, you are playing with their Father in heaven. When you play with them, you are playing with the eternal Father in heaven who is the creator of all humans. Hallelujah. So David is on the run. He, in several occasions, finds, its, it finds his dwelling place not on a mattress, but in a cave. He makes his bed in the cave because he is hiding from Saul. So, in one of his occasions while he was hiding in the cave, he sees a shepherd taking his flock to the wilderness to gaze upon the little grass or whatever is available in that wilderness. So now when he sees that, he can easily relate, to, relate it to his life because he was once upon a Shepherd. Now he can truly relate the life of the shepherd and the sheep to himself. But this psalm is not only a psalm of a testimony, psalm of David, but it also has a eschatological meaning to it. This is a psalm which talks about Messiah. This is a messianic psalm. But David wants to say in all of these that I have a shepherd because of which I will not be shaken. If there is a plan and purpose that God has for my life and the shepherd is in God for my life, the enemy cannot even touch me. Somebody say, touch me. If the shepherd has his God over you, it is for a reason. It is for a purpose. It is for a plan. And the calling that we have for our life, the purpose that God has for your life, let me tell you, the world... The evil powers cannot have any right or authority over you or over your children or over your church because there is somebody who is guarding your life. He is not a human being. He is your God. And if the devil touch you, he is touching God. If the devil play with you, he is playing with God. David experienced rejection in his life. Not only in his career, but also in his family. Being the youngest of his, among his brothers, the brothers got to be in the battlefield as soldiers fighting for their nation, Israel. But because of his age, because he was young, because he was a junior in the house, 
he didn't have all those rights. He was in the wilderness taking care of his father's sheep. You know, when God anoints people, age is not the qualifier. Age is only a number. Hello? When age, when God anoints someone, age is never a qualifier. Age is only a number. Because your age is not what matters. The anointing on you is what matters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever been sidelined or rejected because you were young? Have you ever been rejected or silent because people thought you were not um, uh, old enough? I mean, I've experienced that in my life back in those days. But let me tell you, even when David experienced this rejection and isolation, people looked down on him because of his age. People looked down on him because he was too young or not old enough. God kept doing the work in his life. God keeps working the way that he wants and there is no one who can thwart or stop the work of God in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The anointing on you is what matters. Not your age. The anointing on you is what matters. Look to your neighbor and say, the anointing on you is what matters. Not your age. Not your age. You know, as a younger kid in my family, I thought, I could have some voice in the family. I could have some voice in the family. When a major decision is made in my house, in my family, my dad, and my dad and mom would call all of us together. I thought, finally, I got to say something. I have a voice in the family. But I was always be shut down because I was too young, not old enough, the, uh, the youngest. But let me tell you, how God changes things upside down. Now, because I'm a pastor, Every single decision in the house goes through me. This is the upside kingdom we're talking about. God can do it for me. God can do it for you. Hallelujah. How do you know you have the anointing? How do you know, pastor, how you have the anointing? You know, anointing is not only for, for us to stay on the stage, preach, speak, some words of other language, talk in other tongues, praise and worship, sing with the top of our voice. All of that is good. We need the anointing for that. Nobody with the anointing should ever stay on the stage. All right? But that's not why we have the anointing for. That's not only why we have the anointing for. Why do we need the anointing? How do I know that I have the anointing? Let me tell you. Look in the Bible. Every single instance or every single people who had the anointing upon their life, when we speak, the power of the anointing will be released through our words. When we speak, the situation or circumstances before us may not make sense to us. But when we command and speak with the authority and the anointing that is upon us, there is nothing that can stop the work of the Lord that will be released from our mouth. All the young people in the house, how do you know you have the anointing? When you touch something, the power of the anointing will be activated through your hands. When you enter a place of darkness, the power of anointing will be a light into the darkness you walk into. When you have the anointing upon your life, you will be able to influence people for the gospel and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. When you have the anointing upon your life, hallelujah, the enemy will try to make all things to make his works prosper in your life. But it will be thrown down. It will be cut down. It will be a failure. The hole, the pit that he himself dug, he will fall into it. You know the anointing because your performance chart will start growing up. Because you have the anointing in you. You no longer work with your effort, but you work with the effort which is given to you by the Holy Spirit of God. Throughout the Bible, we see God performing much greater things through the second generation than the first generation. Don't get mad at me. Throughout the Bible, there is a constant instances recorded in the Bible where God does greater things through the second generation than the first generation. How many of you are earnestly praying for the second generation of this church? Come on, let me see the hands. If that's true, let me tell you and prophesy the name of Jesus. I see a youth, God has a specific plan and purpose for them. 
the days ahead, we are going to see greater things that God wants to establish through our young people. And nobody will be able to stop what God wants to do through their life. So David experiences hurt in the family and also in his career. So he experienced rejection in his family. Now, how in his career? King Saul, he promised his daughter in return to take down uh, uh, the giant of Philistine, the Goliath. But he didn't keep his promise. King Saul rejected uh, David and David now experiences hurt in his soul. You know, my kids, they fall every day, almost every day. And every time my son fall, he will cry and scream at the top of his voice. But let me tell you, after five minutes, he forgets the pain, he forgets the fall. And he fall again the next day. The pain that we have in our body, that can be temporary. It may not last for long. But let me tell you, the pain and hurt that we, that we undergo in our soul, that can stay for a long time. That can stay for a really long time. Hallelujah. Much of what we say is influenced by what has happened in our soul. Much of what we do is influenced by what happened, has happened in the past in our soul. If somebody prick you with, your pen, with a pencil, they can injure or they can hurt your body. They may not, it may not hurt their soul. But let me tell you, more powerful is your word that comes from your tongue. The power of life and death is on your tongue. When you speak blessing upon people, it can bring blessing upon their soul. But when you speak curse upon people, that can bring curse and hurt upon people. Their soul. And that soul will be hurt not only for a temporary time. There will be a long time of grief, sorrow, hurt that they will undergo through in their life because of one word that was spoken through us. We thought we were being smart by making a cheap shot. But let me tell you, children of God, we are not called to use this tongue to hurt others. If we use this tongue, it should be to bless others. If we use this tongue, it should be to heal others. Because we have been healed in the name of Jesus. We have been blessed in the name of Jesus. And if you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life, you cannot use your tongue, use your eyes, use your attitude to hurt others. But your life will be a blessing to people. Soul wounds are more hurtful than body wounds. Psychologists would say the main five causes of soul wounds are rejection, abandonment, humiliation, betrayal, and injustice. If you want to know more about it, we have a health, mental health seminar happening here on May 4th. I want to advertise for the mental health seminar right now. All right? Uh, you, will, you will hear more about it. The common signs that somebody is hurt within or somebody is hurt in the soul. These are the signs, common signs. Shame-led thoughts, insecurity, fear, trust issues with people, trust issues with God. Anger towards God, anger towards others. Struggling with surrendering themselves to God. Difficulty discerning the will of God. Low self-esteem. I'm not good enough. Blaming yourself. Unforgiveness. Chaotic life. Emotion driven instead of God led. Guilt. Disconnection from God and others. Worry and anxiety driven. Helplessness. Feeling of unworthy of God's love. Reactive emotions. These are some of the signs of a person who has been hurt within his soul. But let me tell you, it need not be that way all your life. It need not be that way all your life. When David experienced rejection, humiliation, abandonment, when he experienced a hurt and wound in his soul, you know there was an anointing of the Holy Spirit that was poured upon his head. That was poured upon his head. Hallelujah. God felt the same. David felt the same. But it did not remain that way. Three aspects of uh, uh, restoration which I want to bring to your attention this morning. And I want to close with that. Three aspects of restoration. Number one, restoration of the soul needs the anointing. Somebody say restoration of the soul 
needs the anointing. In verse, um, 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 in verse 3 when he says, he restores my soul. In verse 5, David says, he anoints my head with oil. There is no reference to any medicinal uh, uh, medicine or anything that was used uh, to restore his soul. One element that is only seen in the whole of the psalm is the oil. Somebody say oil. Why is oil important? You know, the story of the Good Samaritan, when the Good Samaritan saw that guy lying on the ground, you know what he did? He bandaged the wounds and poured oil and wine. Why do you need the oil? Let me tell you. This is a revelation that God gave me. If there is a wound on your body, you would call 911 or you would go to a hospital. You will get a nurse and then she will stitch your bandage. She will stitch your wound. She will bandage your wound. You know, by the way, the latest and the newest are a nurse in our house. Jennifer! So if, would, if I would have a medical issue, if I would have a, a wound in my body, I would call Jennifer because she's more accessible than anyone in this room. I would go to her and I would tell her, please do something on me. And she would apply medicine. She would uh, bind my wound. She would bandage me. And I would experience natural um, um, healing through the medicine, with the help of the medicine. But when there is a wound in your soul, how do you apply medicine on your soul? Tell me, how do you apply medicine on your soul? There is no way you can apply medicine on your soul. But let me tell you, when David says, he anoints my head with oil, it's just not rubbing or spreading. Because I mentioned this in the Malayan service as well. David knows what it means to be anointed by God. He knows very well the name or the word anointing. It is just not spreading oil on the top of the head of the lamb. It is actually purposely, intentionally anointing a sheep with the oil for a purpose. What am I trying to say? This anointing is enough for every hurt to be healed that has occurred in your soul. This anointing is enough for any wounded soul to be restored by God. Hallelujah. So anointing is just not only for praise and worship. Anointing is just not only for doing exploits for Jesus. Anointing is not only for preaching a good sermon or singing a good song or speaking in tongues. But let me tell you, the anointing over your head can bring healing upon your life. Bring healing upon your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I've seen partners in a family trying to resolve, reconcile with a lot of conversations with the help of a psychologist. With all due respect to all the psychiatrists in the house, let me tell you, the conversations in some of those families that I have been with, I have ministered to, the more they talk, the more they're being rippled from each other. The more they talk to resolve, to, to reconcile with each other, the more worse the situation are going through. But let me tell you, if each member of the family had the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon their heads, irrespective of being a partner, irrespective of being a parent and child, there will be a healing process that God will send in your family. A healing process that will be sent between your partners. All that you've got to ask for these days is, Lord, send me an anointing that would heal my family. An anointing that would heal my family. Hallelujah. How do you know that you are healed? When you look at your past, you will not be triggered when you see that again. When you look at your scars, you will not be triggered by the pain anymore. When you look at your children, you will not have pain of what they have done to you in the past. When you look at your parents, you will not be pained or hurt by what they did to you in the past. With the anointing, there comes healing. There comes healing. Secondly, the restoration of the soul will overflow. Somebody say overflow. 
you know sam um, uh, david when he writes a psalm he is very careful to also write when he anoints my head with oil my cup overflows you know there ha- there are there are several purposes for god in our lives but ultimately through all of those calling gifting and purposes that god has in our life it is to be a blessing upon people it is to be a blessing upon people you know david he experienced that healing in his life because of which he when he had a situation for a re- uh, for a payback to repay for all the hurt that was caused unto him by his family and by king saul one day there was king saul lying sleeping unconscious david could easily take down his life this is the same man who came after david's life david could easily kill king saul but we know that he didn't do it because why because the anointing on you is not to kill others but give life unto others your anointing upon you is not to curse others but to bless others hallelujah you know let me give an assignment for the church next time you meet somebody in the church tell them or give them a word of encouragement next time you meet somebody in your church or outside your church in your job in your company in your career in your school give them a word of encouragement hallelujah they may not smell good they may not feel good to be with they may not seem to be a happy person they may not be a seem to be a friendly person it doesn't matter they you may not like their color it doesn't matter you are called to be a blessing a light unto the nation you are called to be a salt in this world which means you got to give flavor of god through your actions through your walks and through your talks what is the flavor of god the flavor of god is the blessing of god hallelujah thirdly the restoration of the soul will seek god's presence will seek god's presence in verse 2 we read he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters you know if you look at the judean uh, wilderness can i have a slide the picture of this judean wilderness you know if you look at the judean wilderness this is judean wilderness we don't actually see grass we don't actually see water i mentioned it in, in the maram service as well but for a sheep all that matters is the presence of the shepherd shepherd knows when to give water and food to the sheep and the confidence that a sheep has is not in the field in the wilderness the confidence that a sheep has is in the shepherd in the shepherd in the shepherd so every time there is a tendency for the sheep to waver away to go away from the flock they will have a tendency to come back to the sheep because this sheep is different from other sheep other shepherds this sheep is always concerned about the future and well-being of the sheep he will provide food he will provide everything that is necessary for the well-being and the sustenance and the life of the sheep as long as this shepherd is their shepherd as long as we have jesus as our shepherd my dear friends the more we go away from him we will always have a craving back to him craving back to him you know out of all the 100 books in our shelf 100 books in my house there'll be one book that i would always come back to if you take me for a buffet there'll be one food that i will come back for out of all those friends that i have in my circle there'll be one friend who whom, uh, whom i want to come back to out of all the applications in our phone there'll be one application that we'll always want to come back to why because that gives us joy that gives us joy let me tell you if your true joy comes from the lord there will always be a craving for the presence of the holy ghost if you are satisfied with the presence of god there will always be a need for more somebody said need for more need for more the more you uh, uh, the more you experience the presence of god you want more you want more you want more because these are days where god is raising a generation who will not be satisfied with the ordinary but 
they will only be satisfied with the extraordinary. God is raising a generation who will not be satisfied with the natural. They will only be satisfied by the supernatural. I don't know if you believe it or not. God is going to raise people from our church who will not compromise the word for the world. Who will not compromise the word for the world. Hello? Jesus Christ, hallelujah. God is raising people. God wants to use people who are thirsty, who are hungry for the presence of God. God is want to use people who would stand for His name, who would crave for the presence of the Holy Ghost. No matter whatever happens in your life, you will have time to sit in the presence of God. No matter how many busy schedules you will have in your life, you will always have time. You will find time to pray, to fast, to spend in the presence of God because that is where you get true life. That is where you get true courage. That is where you get true strength. The more you receive God, the more you will want more of Him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. These days I pray that our worship services, our Wednesday prayers, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to tell you how our Wednesday services, Wednesday Bible studies among the young people are resulting these days. There is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit among our young people these days. I don't know if you can believe or not. This is the end time and God is pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. Young men will see visions. Young men and women will prophesy. Young men and women will start seeing dreams. Because they don't rely on their capabilities. They rely on the capability of the Holy Spirit. So when you have the Holy Spirit, you want more of God. Firstly, when you are going through a hurt or a soul wound, number one remedy is ask God to anoint you with the Holy Spirit. Because with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you will receive healing. You will receive healing. Secondly, with the restoration of your soul, you will always overflow. You will always overflow. I want to end with an imagery here. You know, um, Obeth, you know, a wounded soul, how does a wounded soul look like? I looked at several um, 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 uh, uh, psychology research papers and finally Something caught my attention. You know, a wounded soul would look like this. A man who is looking very perfectly handsome and all right. Like our dear brother. All right? But the problem is, the wounded soul will have knives pricked or pierced on his back. And when you overflow into other people's life with those knives and with those wounds, the only thing that comes out from your mouth are knives that will cut others. You are cut you will cut others. You are hurt, you will hurt others. You know, including pastors like us, we can wear, it's easy for us to wear a jacket like this. You want this jacket, Mane? It's easy for us to wear this jacket to cover our wounds, to cover our swords, to cover our knives and those hurts that we are having on our back. And the moment we speak from the stage, these words can turn into words of hurt, turn into words of wounds upon other lives. Who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do it. But you know what? When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, there was a piercing that He underwent in His body. Not on His back, but on His side. And when He experienced that piercing in His body, all your piercing on your body is taken away and is on Jesus' body. You no longer have to stay as a victim of those hurt, of those wounds that you experience in your life. You will no longer be triggered by any of those hurtful moments that you had to undergo in your life. When you are healed by the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life, your wounds are washed away in the name of Jesus. Your wounds are healed in the name of Jesus because He took your wound upon Himself. Why do we worship God? Because He changed our life forever. Why do we worship God? Because there is no community like us who are called to be blessing upon the people. We are blessed so that we may bless others. We may bless others through our words. We may bless others through our actions. We may bless others through all our influences. All eyes closed. Let's pray. 
Father, this is a humble prayer these days. That more than any cravings that we may have in our flesh, we may crave more for your presence, Lord. There will be absolutely nothing that can satisfy us. We will only be satisfied with the extraordinary, with the supernatural, with the divine. Or there's anyone over here going through a psychological soul wound. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus and we command healing upon them right now. Let there be restoration. Let there be reconciliation. Let there be resolving among people, Lord Father. Lord, we don't have to stay in our hurt all through our life. The hurt that we have experienced through people, through loss of uh, our loved ones, through things that's going on around the world, injustice and all of that. But we know one thing for sure. When you died on the cross of Calvary, you took away all our wounds. And we don't have to live with the wounds anymore in our lives, Lord Father. I pray there may be a healing touch of your Holy Spirit right now as I speak in the name of Jesus. I claim healing in the name of Jesus. I speak healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray our lives will not result in hurting or wounding anyone in our lives. But Lord Father, our lives, our talks will be a source of blessing, healing to many people. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Amen, amen.